Right, so thanks for coming. Uh, I'll just kick off. Uh, my name is uh, Vijay Raghavan. Uh, you can call me Vijay. And I'm from uh, Cognizant Technology Solutions. I'm part of the Cognizant uh, Digital Engineering team. Uh, in terms of uh, what I do on a daily basis, uh, I engage the client on digital transformation. Uh, most of my work is, uh, in, is, is uh, related to cloud enablement of applications, cloud transformation, as well as looking at you know, existing monolith application and then saying how, how can you sort of make it uh, more agile, more efficient. And uh, in terms of my contact details, uh, you know, I've, got, I've put in some contact details as well. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to sort of, you know, uh, sort of uh, mention is uh, my hobby, right? So one of the hobbies that I have is uh, I'm a pigeon enthusiast. I don't know how many of you know what is a pigeon enthusiast. Okay, a lot of <laughs> S's there, right? So, so uh, a pigeon enthusiast is someone who likes different types of pigeons. How many did you know that recently there was a pigeon that was sold for 1.25 million? Okay, so this is called the Lewis Hamilton of pigeons, uh, called Armando. And this is a racing pigeon, by the way. So what they do is they can travel um, thousands of miles at a time and reach home. And there's a different type of pigeon as well. That's called a racing pigeon, right? And there's another type of pigeon called homing pigeon, which can be airborne for up to 18 hours at a time. And when I was, uh, when I was in teens, I had about 50 pigeons. And there's a way to sort of, you know, identify the pedigree of a pigeon, right? And uh, the way you do that is, you know, obviously the length of the pigeon, the, the, uh, the, the way the tail is, the feather and everything else. But two things that stand out is the, the eye of the pigeon as well as the size of the head, right? I'm assuming the size of the head is related to size of brain. But, you know, eye of the pigeon, I'm not really sure. There's not been a lot of uh, no research into it, but there we go. That is something uh, that I like, and hopefully you've enjoyed that as well. Yeah. All right, about Cognizant, uh, we've got a uh, stall as well outside, and uh, we are uh, relatively an end company. Uh, we do uh, business and technology services, and this is obviously uh, a marketing slide. If you want to know more, uh, please do drop in, and obviously my colleagues are there to help you. And before I start off with the, with the subject, right, what I want to do is I want to talk a bit about something. I'm sure this something is very interesting. And, and it is climbing the top of the world. And that is obviously no guesses, no prizes for guessing that, right? That is obviously Mount Everest. How many of you, if you got a chance, would like to climb Mount Everest? Raise your hands, please. Oh, three, four, maybe, right? But I can tell you something, right? It is a miserable experience. It's an awful experience, okay? So, so if you're thinking about it, I'll tell you why it's an awful experience now. To start with, it's very expensive. Did you know how much would it cost to climb Mount Everest? At least $40,000, $45,000. So that includes the, the flight, as well as uh, uh, the, the paying the Sherpas, the logistics, and the, uh, and the you know, uh, oxygen tanks and everything else. And it can go up to 100,000 as well, right? 120,000. So it's quite expensive if you sort of look at you know, uh, the, the wages and everything else. It's quite expensive. Let's say you somehow got the money, right? The, the, and then you know, the next thing is the weather. In winter, the, the winds can blow up to 200 miles per hour. And if you are thinking summer, so summer is going to be better, it is only 10 days in a year that's suitable for climbing Mount Everest. And it invariably falls between May 15th and May 25th. And it's maximum of 10, 12 days. But in 2011, it was actually two days. In 2018, it was more like 11 days. So everything, everyone climbing the summit is usually mostly climbing during this 10, 8, 5, 2 days. And you can imagine how much traffic is going to be there on those days. And obviously, it is the tallest mountain. We all know that. Above 25,000 feet, it is called death zone. Why is it called death zone? Because the air pressure is only 33% of the sea level, which means without an oxygen tank, you will die in 30 minutes. You will die if you 
have some sort of sickness, if you are injured because there is no helicopter rescue there. You will die if of, of suffocation. You will die of uh, lack of oxygen. And at that uh, height, the rescue is virtually impossible except for Sherpas to sort of carry your body down. Obviously, there are a lot of dead bodies there, so that's not a good sight as well. And let's say you are sort of prepared, you sort of acclimatize to yourself uh, with the weather and everything. Oof, you didn't want to hear this, it is not the hardest mountain to climb. Technically speaking, it is still very tough, it is still very tough, but there is K2, there is uh, Aigari in Alps, there is uh, Annapurna, there is uh, uh, Nanga Parvat. They are tougher than Mount Everest. Mount Everest is probably eighth or ninth toughest mountain to climb technically in the world, right? So there are about four deaths per 100 uh, people climbing uh, Mount Everest, and Annapurna is like more like, you know, uh, you know tens, right? And so then there are also less number of people climbing other mountains as compared to, you know, Mount Everest as well. So it is not the ultimate mountain to climb, right? Let's say, you know, you made up your mind, and then obviously you've got some drive to, uh, to, to climb Mount Everest, but what might happen is the day you want to climb or the month you want to climb, there is some sort of uh, weather condition, some sort of uh, blizzard, some sort of storm. The whole plan may go for a toss. You might not end up climbing. What it means is you wasted money, you wasted too much of your time because even though you're climbing for only two or three days, the preparation and everything else is like two months. You, you land there in Nepal and then there's two months before you actually start climbing. Uh, Everything is, go is wasted, right? You start all over once again. And those are the reasons why you shouldn't climb Mount Everest. But come on, can you see the Mount Everest there in the background? So beautiful, isn't it? And that's one reason you should climb, because it is the tallest mountain in the world. It is at just below the cruising altitude of a, of a passenger jet. Uh, it's like 10 times the height of Burj Khalifa. So if you've seen Burj Khalifa, it's like, you know, you can imagine how, how tall this mountain is. And logistics have improved as well, right? It's not that things are more streamlined. There are companies that do, it, uh, do this for a living. There are Sherpas that are, that are used to this sort of a condition. There is a Sherpa that has climbed Mount Everest 21 times, okay? So things have improved, right? Success rate has gone up. But there is obviously a weather factor which is, uh, which is not in our control, but nonetheless, the climbing Mount Everest has become a big a business. And think about the sense of achievement, right? So if you're climbing Mount Everest, top of the world, uh, you've gone through a grueling uh, you know, preparation, you climbed it, you've taken a photo of yourself uh, on the summit, fantastic, isn't it? The sense of achievement is uncomparable. From there on, you believe nothing is impossible. The way you look at life is different. Right? You want to do things that you've not even thought about before. There is some amount of uh, uh, different outlook that you will have for life, right? And then you, the people that come back have a different sort of uh, you know, uh, view as to what they want to do next. And let's not forget this one. This obviously means that you don't have to make any New Year resolution to lose weight. So you'll be super fit. And with this new mindset, you don't need any resolutions anymore. But how, what does it got to do with uh, digital transformation? Right? That's the question. That was a story, but we can relate it to digital transformation because what has happened climbing Mount Everest is you become more agile. You become more leaner. You think you've gone through a grueling uh, mountaineering and then now you think things are possible, right? The way you look at life is different. Same way, well, and then what, the, what these mountaineers make of themselves after that is up to them, right? And, and in a very similar sort of fashion, the, a similar thing happens when you sort of go through a digital transformation. The application are fitter, leaner, more efficient, more modular, right? And, and it's, it doesn't give you, the moment you've done the digital transformation, it's not going to give you 50% improvement in your market, uh, 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 you know, capability. Or, you know, it, it, it will not give you the additional revenue. But from there on, you have got the ability to sort of introduce new changes into production, and then that means you can respond to the customer more quickly, which might result in additional revenue, additional business for your company, right? That's one reason why you should do, 
you should become more agile, which means you have to go through some sort of digital transformation. But let's look at, right, so for in my role, I come across a number of customers across UK. Most of them are going through some sort of digital transformation. If I ask this question, are you doing digital transformation? They'll say, yes, yes, we are, right? I've got some examples here. So this uh, payment uh, client is uh, creating a fundamentally new generation, cutting edge payment platform, right? And the idea is not to sell to just the end customers, but to create a platform that enables uh, the, the consumers as well as customers like Tesco, Waitrose, etc., to sell their product to their consumers, right? It's truly a next generation pay payment platform that they want to uh, create. A pharmacy company is creating uh, one of the best omnichannel experience that you can have uh, when you sort of, you know, you fall ill or you've got a certain symptom, you want to sort of look up and then see how what goes on, what is going on. You got this experience of going into the store as well as doing it online and then bringing it all together, plus your medical history data, everything put together, it gives you, it's more intelligent, it is sort of helping you through the entire process, right? Another example here is uh, an intelligent uh, collection platform, right? A collection, uh, someone is not paid the uh, paid what they owe to the bank, and there's a collection platform. But you know, sort of, you know, call the collection platform. They have got no idea. They're gonna uh, no idea that you're gonna default. But things could be much more improved because bank has the data, or it can at least pull the data, and it can be more proactive. Look, we think you're not gonna pay the next uh, payment, but here's the plan for you, right? We think you are in uh, some sort of trouble, but here is the advice for you. So, a next generation, uh, you no know, uh, intelligent collection platform that helps you rather than becoming sort of you know a, an interface for you to uh, you know last with the bank or you know uh, pay your uh, dues similarly there are other customers like you know i want to refactor my uh, you know uh, customer or uh, public facing uh, platform i want to re uh, re uh, redo my entire mortgages journey and so on and so forth fundamentally everything everyone is looking at a new way of architecting, a new way of looking at, the, looking at the whole customer journey, new ways of engaging, new ways of enabling customer. And in order to, when they sort of you know, embark on this journey, there are different things uh, that they would do in order to make this digital, digital transformation happen. I've seen uh, some of the, some of the you know, failings, if we might say, right, uh, that could be avoided, right? And I've put together a top 10 here. And all of these top 10 is, you know, as interesting as, you know, pigeon, uh, fancying a pigeon or, you know, climbing a mountain. So there are some case studies, examples that sort of uh, helps you relate. But also they are very pragmatic, right? Uh, in some, I've tried to be as less technical as possible, but there are places, uh, because I'm, a, I'm passionate about technology, I have brought in some element of technology as well. But that's what I think is the, is the most uh, you know, eminent problem at my, uh, across my clients, and, and that's what I've tried to sort of, you know, cover here. Right, so the first one is vision. I mean, we all understand, right? There has to be a vision, right? The, the point that I want to make is, who doesn't know Nokia, right? So we all know Nokia, right? So the, the management said, we didn't do anything that was wrong. Somehow we lost. But that's not the whole story. The Symbian operating system that they were using was not up to the scratch. They knew it. It was not that Nokia didn't know it. They chose to ignore it. It's like Blockbuster, trying to do something, and there's a competition that they can clearly see going to overtake themselves, uh, going to overtake Blockbuster, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen, right? They wouldn't listen to anyone. They want to do things their own. And, and that's a problem, because they don't have the vision. They've got this short-term goal of, you know, how do I meet market targets? How do I sort of uh, make... Uh, my existing product better, and sometimes that might not be the answer. Looking at your competition and learning from your competition uh, could be equally important, right? And uh, let, let's look, look at this example, All right? Three companies. Uh, one is a smart energy company, and it's got this vision, right? They want to standardize, they want to streamline, they want to optimize, right? So this is a sort of vision. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And then there's a super bank which wants to be the bank of, uh, bank of the customer, right? Uh, their uh, you know, their uh, mission statement, uh, vision statement is, I want to optimize the most heavily used system and improve in a meaningful way, 
and there's a health, thing, health uh, you know, and there's a pharma customer as well there, uh, which sort of talks about uh, how do I accelerate, build, because pharma is all about uh, introducing new drugs. And what they really want from IT is to accelerate that process. So it's what is reflected, right? So what I like about this is uh, they're all good. But again, I can't relate. As a developer, I can't relate, right? And the most that I can relate to is the one in the middle, right? Uh, some of you may disagree with me. But I'm looking at an application. I'm a bank. I'm not a software uh, uh, you know, uh, company, right? And uh, I, can I can't fundamentally overhaul all my applications overnight. So the best thing for me is to look at the application and see how it can be improved, optimized for two people. One is my customer. The other is my internal staff colleague, right? Very clear, right? It, it's saying exactly what I should do as a developer. And I think that, for me, is, is, is a good vision or a mission statement. And then how does this mission help you, right? So some examples I have uh, drawn here, right? Amazon started off as a book company. We all know that. And uh, today, they are known for their cloud. And that's because they're always concentrated on customer. Their, their mission is customer-centric, right? I will later on talk about what is called <coughs> an internal press release, right? And that has helped on, uh, Amazon to innovate. They're always innovating from a customer point of view. And things can happen when you have the right mission or the right vision statement because it translates, it propagates. The biggest challenge for a CEO is not putting out a vision statement but translating it. Right? Amazon has done that really well. The other one that I like here is ASOS. They're very clear. We don't care. It's 20-something, and we are selling it to them. Perfect. Right? I like that because you know, it's very clear in terms of what they're trying to do. Everyone understands it. Right? So you know what the uh, age that you're looking at, and then you know what they like and sort of everything aligns to it. So number one, make sure your you know, vision is consistent. It is uh, clear, and it propagates through your company. And then make sure that everyone can relate to it. All right, so you got the mission. Everyone is happy. right? Now, what do you do with that mission? So you try to relate to that mission on a daily basis or a weekly basis in your sprint call, in your sprint meetings, in your uh, delivery discussion. And who is, who is doing it? Of course, your developers, right? What do they need? They need empowerment. They need to have the control. What you can't have is it's a typical sort of a, you know, a structure. If you look at this, there is an application. The application is sliced into you no know, thousand pieces horizontally. Each one is a different team. And who brings things together? I mean, obviously there is a, there's a project manager that sort of is responsible for bringing this application together, but it doesn't always work, right? Application A has a dependency on application B, or, or, or you know your you know UI has a dependency on a, on a backend database and things like that. You end up with a story, and it is broken down into 100 pieces, and each one having a dependency on some other team. Right? You've all seen this, and this is not a right pattern to sort of implement when you're doing digital transformation. And that brings nicely to this sort of, uh, this, uh, you know, this was uh, in 1967, and it still holds good today. And then it's, a, it's an evergreen quote. You are replicating your organization. Most of the customers that I look at, they've got an organization structure, Applications exactly reflect the organization. They say, okay, so we, we need to bring together the dev development and the operations team together on one simple on one single page. They say that's not possible because they are two different teams. That's not going to work, right? You need to have an end-to-end -end ownership for the teams. And Amazon championed this two-page team. So the, the way they think about it is a team shouldn't be more than six because the, the, the cross-communication that you will have if it is more than six, is too many. That means it is not a productive team. And uh, you know, if it's a if a team is large, I'm sure you come across this. You always underestimate the effort, right? I've got a team of 20. I'll say no, I can do it in a week. But it's a smaller team. You will be more pragmatic. And um, if an application, if an, if an organization is too big and you sort of have to bring together the various teams, then there are a lot of uh, frameworks that are available. One such framework is Scaled Agile. I'm sure you would have come across this, which sort of brings the team together on a common cadence. But nonetheless, having a team 
uh, each scrum team that's more than six is not a right sort of a combination to have as per Amazon. But there are many research uh, that has been done on it. I would say up to 10, you're okay, right? Up to 10, you still can manage the communication within the team. But most important is, you know, they sort of has this, they deliver this feature end to end, right? You, they're not dependent on other teams to deliver it, so they're independent, they're empowered, right? So, yes, the, the motto should be, you build it and you run it, right? So it's, it's up to you, right? So it is, it is you that is delivering it. You understand the business outcome, you understand what you're delivering, and hence, you should be the one that's deploying it and managing it there on. All right, so I've got the vision, the mission, the teams are empowered, but how do I start? You start small, but think big. I couldn't emphasize this enough, right? And the way I think about this is every transformation project that starts off starts off on a grand scale. We will do this, we will change the world, this is the tech. Their preparation is sometimes two years before they even have started coding. But you know, there is a saying, right? Large corporations tend to be that, right? A smaller startup are more nimble, agile. They sort of know how to start small. But that's not true, that's not true. Look at this. This is uh, Google Cars, right? You know, when it started, it started in 2009. The vision is big, right? So the vision is to help people that drive, right? The vision is there are about 1.5 million deaths every year because of human error, right? And they are clearly saying that's the market we want to target. We want to make, uh, ensure that the human error is less, which means I'm going to automate it. I mean, Google had a lot of money. They could have invested billions into it, and then they could have uh, you know, ran this for like a couple of years, and then they could have delivered. But they started small. Their budget was smaller than some of the advertising business uh, you know, budget for some of these big companies, right? When they started in 2009. And they put together this car, which can do, which can sort of identify where it is, who's around me. For example, if there's a cycle coming, and then it, it sort of can calculate the, 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 the angle of the elbows, and then from there on it can calculate as to whether he's taking a right, going straight, or left, and then make decisions on the go, right? And that's the best example of starting small, but thinking big. There is an example here, which is a bit technical, but I want to, I want to touch upon it because uh, the, some of the developers in here uh, might, uh, relate, might be able to relate to it. Is there any Delphi developer here? Guess not. There is none in UK, actually. Right. So, <laughs> right. so uh, the Delphi, you know, this is uh, one of the you know, clients. Got a monolith on the left, right? Uh, they've got this uh, you know, UI, the front end, the middleware, everything is built into uh, this uh, unknown technology called Delphi, right? Uh, and it's a very key application, and it's, uh, it's used by a number of broadcasters across uh, the UK, so as well as globally, right? And luckily, what they've got done is, you know, they've batches and everything, C, C++, Unix sort of, uh, you know, jobs. And they've got this database, a relational database, which, is, uh, which has got a lot of business logic on, uh, in it as well. So if you're looking at this application and then saying, okay, how do I modularize this? It is the UI you need to modularize. It is the middleware, which is Delphi, as well as your triggers, rules, et cetera, and to, allow, and to an extent, the, the bad jobs themselves. So at the end of the day, this, this application is used by a number of clients, so they can't be, there can be no client impact, right? And, the, and these com applications are complex. I've never seen a client saying that I've got this application developed over the last 10 years, but it is easy, it doesn't do much, right? It is always complex. The complexity comes because of accidental complexity. You add something to it, someone else adds something to it, something else to it, assuming what you added is, is not good enough, or, or no, it's not doing what is expected of it, and there is this accidental complexity that is built in, and sometimes, you know, do domain can be complex as well. Very quickly, breaking this, what, does, what did this customer do, right? So they did, they sort of extracted out the UI, right? So they, they adopted Azure here, as well as uh, they built some sort of a containerization for the UI using .NET and C Sharp, and they were still calling the business layer of Delphi. There is an amount of refactoring that needs to be done for the database, and to reduce these jobs, triggers, they did that. 
And there is an, there is an important takeaway here, right? So you don't rewrite C, C++ code because it is crucial for the business uh, uh, that the domain, right? And then you sort of could modularize that as well. So the point that I'm trying to make here is uh, it doesn't have to be Big Bang. It doesn't have to be, you think, blue, green, you know, blue sky and then start refactoring everything. You could refactor in stages. And a lot of my customers are, are doing it. But don't forget, a digital transformation is about rethinking. It is about reimagining. But at the same time, thinking, starting small, right? And you don't sort of uh, always think about, you know, it's not, it does, it's not about always microservices. It's not about you know, making everything loosely coupled distributed. It's about what sort of an agility do you need from your application? What needs to be modular, right? If I have got five, five teams, and if I were to split this application between these five teams, can those teams perform independently, right? Those are the questions to ask and refactor rather than starting off with a very you know, grand plan of refactoring everything that's out there, right? So it is about slicing. It is about uh, dicing, strangulating your application, the functionality, and thinking about the risk and frame there on building your stack, right? It's not about day one, big bang, do it all together, and then two year plan. All right, so we've, talk, we've gone through why should we, store, why should we do, you know, start small, but think big. But how can technology help? Right, so technology, there's a lot of uh, you know, technology innovations that have happened, cloud, microservices, uh, your you know, containerization, et cetera, et cetera, right, which is going to help the efficiency. But you know, most of the time what I say is, <laughs> a digital transformation is a resume building exercise, all right? You're not, using, you're not using technology to solve business problems, right? You're, you're using technology, uh, you're using business to uh, solve technology problems. It is the other way around. Because you want to have the latest and greatest, but you don't think for a second, is that the right thing to do? Why do I say that, right? So it is called chasing technology. I want to have the latest. Look at this graph, right? So what does it tell me? So I'm a AWS solution professional uh, certified, and, and it's one of the toughest exams out there. Uh, and I finished uh, uh, at least, I think, one, one and a half years ago. But I couldn't keep up with the pace of AWS. This is the rate of innovation. And it is true across all the cloud providers. Things that are true today are no longer to, uh, true uh, two weeks down the line. So if you want to have the latest, and one of my customers said, I want to use Fargate, right? Because it's good. I have read one page. I think it's really good. So let's use Fargate. Fargate is one of the Docker orchestration that, that you know, AWS have recently come up with. But it's not even proven, right? It, it's some time before you sort of can adopt some of these technologies. So if you're chasing a technology, if you are trying to do digital transformation because uh, you want to build your resume, there's never, a, there's never going to be a success, right? You're always chasing. So there is an example here. Um, a simple enterprise service bus. So how many of you have worked on enterprise service bus? I mean, of course, heard of it. Yes, a lot of you, a lot of you have, yeah. So what does it do? It does routing, it does transformation, uh, it shouldn't have business logic, right? Uh, it does the tokenization, it does uh, enrichment, so on and so forth. Simple, right? And why would you use it? Because uh, you want to integrate different applications between uh, internally within your organization as well as external uh, third parties as well, right? So I was talking to this customer. This customer says, okay, this is what it is. I've got this problem because this uh, you know, enterprise service bus is not scaling. It is not cloud ready. So I want to replace it. Uh, the way I'm going to replace it is I want to have something modern. I want to have something cutting edge. I want to make sure that I'm using microservices. But guess what? On my left, on, on the left uh, here, the inventory is a third party. Uh, the pricing is a third party, as well as the internal applications on the right, they won't change. They will not change their interface because they're uh, they're saying the ESB is supposed to do that, right? I'm not going to change my interface. That they are very clear. They, they will continue to use the XML. But this guy wants to have microservices. I have got a problem with this because the existing workflows in this ESB platform 
existing business logic, I can't port it to a microservice. It's impossible, right? They don't have the skill set. The, the guys that are actually working on this team are dragging and dropping today, right? So they don't even have the skill set, right? And uh, I can't run it alongside the existing. So one, you have to also think about how, do, how am I going to put this in production? Because at some point in time, both of these applications are going to run in parallel, right? I can't do that either if I put a microservices in it. And I have to replicate the entire logic and there are very less SMEs in this organization. I can't do that either. So there's a lot of heavy lifting that I have to do. The answer is they should consider an ESB. And the ESB should be cloud ready. And they should sort of port this existing work uh, workflow to a new ESB. They shouldn't be thinking about microservices because that is not the right application there. Another study here. So I'm sure, again, you all know that enterprise, uh, even small and medium as well, it is not just the large enterprises, right? So they tend to buy software, not use it. And the cost of it is in billions, right? The billions are being wasted because of uh, not investing enough time or because uh, you've not done the due diligence or, or you didn't understand what the product offering was. Here, it is about $600 for a desktop. A per desktop, uh, the cost of uh, uh, the uh, the cost of you know so wasted software, right? So, hence technology is there to solve business. It is not the other way around. <sighs> okay, so okay, let's say okay. So we made peace, right? We will use all the best uh, practices as well as uh, uh, we will use uh, cloud, right? We will use the right product. But the next thing is never start from scratch. How many of you are already aware of this, right? So there are a lot of pass environments. Uh, there are a lot of pre-built packaged applications. You will use what is right for the job. So here, the real differentiator here is essentially the application that you're creating, right? The code that you are actually building. If it is cloud, it is prescriptive. It tells you exactly what containerization to use, and there are some uh, Options there, you could go with the one based on what you're trying to do and also the maturity of that application. But think about it. If I were to assemble that same thing on cloud by myself, there's a lot of combination and permutation. This combination permutation doesn't end there. One of my customers said, you know, look, I've got so many applications. I'm trying to do a, you know, microservices sort of an architecture. I just looked up and there's a lot of options. Can you come and help me select the best option? I said, you're using this sort of a cloud, and, and the best uh, platform out there is this. No, 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 I want to have control, right? So choose one for me, choose two for me from this. It's an impossible task, right? Because these things keep changing on a weekly, monthly basis. And cloud is there for a reason, right? It is prescriptive. And trying to assemble this is, is like, you know, it's a, it, it is, you're trying to uh, do heavy lifting. You've got a car, but you still want to uh, drive the cycle. Uh, because you don't believe in car. That's what, that's what this is. So, cloud also helps you in terms of uh, uh, the, the business side, right? The, the efficiency. If you look at this, some of the numbers are staggering, right? So, the moment you start using cloud, start adopting some of the best practices of cloud, you're talking about multiple times increase in productivity. And that's one reason, that's one very good reason why you should invest in, in cloud, plus you should use the capabilities of cloud, but not just use it as an infra as a service and then build your solutions on top of it because that's not the, uh, that's not the right approach. So use pass and save money, right? That's, that's the, uh, the fifth point. So I was rehearsing last night and I come to this, uh, you know, I came to this fifth slide and then I sort of saw, thought, you know, I would like to hear a story. So there is a story, right, coming up because I was bored then, right? So, <laughs> so what I want to talk about is, uh, I was in India last uh, two weeks ago. I, there's, a, there's a national forest in India. Well, there are a number of them, of course. Uh, this one is Nagarohale. It happens to be about 80 kilometers from my, where I live. So I can literally go uh, in the morning, go to the na national forest, see animals, and come back. Right? And, uh, and that's what I did. I went to this forest two times, and these are some of the pictures that I've taken. There's a monkey there. Of course, of course the, the forest, as you can see, is very thick. And, uh, and it is, the visibility is very, very low. The point I want to make here is, because the visibility is low, there is no way to know 
where the animals are. You could be standing right next to a tiger, you wouldn't know, because it's a very thick forest. Uh, and the monkeys make a weird sound. They make different sounds to sort of tell you if there is a predator around, right? And, and obviously, they are telling their clan. And I know you can say we are, we are also a part of the clan, but yeah. Uh, so this host, right, uh, who's taking us through the, uh, through the forest, and he stops wherever the monkey makes the sound, and then we sort of wait. Sometimes we wait for half an hour, sometimes we wait for one hour. If you get lucky, we see a tiger or a leopard and things like that, right? But the, 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 the sound that the monkey makes is different depending on the type of animal. And also it depends on uh, or, you know, what, where the animal is, the physical location of the animal, right? And that helps monkey and other species of monkeys, they can all understand, but also other animals can also understand. It is a bit like your children's book, right, where different animals are talking to each other. That's how it is. It is fantastic. If you're there, you will really enjoy it. And, and the response to this feedback that the monkey is giving is not always the same. For example, a, a specific sound might mean there is a hawk or an eagle. So you come down, you go down, go up on the tree. If you see a tiger, you go up on the trees because tigers can't climb. And if you see a leopard, this is very weird, right? The monkeys come down, right? They stare at the leopard because leopard is an ambush predator. The moment it is seen, it won't attack, right? So the feedback is important, right? And also the way you uh, give that feedback is also important. How is it understood by the clan, by other species as well, is very important, right? And, and that is the point I'm going to, I want to make, right? On the left side, you've got feedback, which is to do with your, you know, can releases, blue, green, right? All of that, that's more technical. Obviously, you know, uh, there, are cloud, there is cloud uh, you know, um, offerings which help you really uh, build that. But I'm talking about the one, uh, uh, I'm talking about that one. We, are we building the right product, which is to do with your business feedback, right? Have you done the right research? Have you done uh, the uh, right benefit analysis? And more often, I see the analysis ha has not been thorough, right? One of my customers had this problem, right? So they said, look, we, are, well, we want to do digital transformation, and innovation is part of it, right? We've done a lot of innovation, right? But again, somehow, it's not... It's not giving us any results. It turns out what they were doing is the business innovation in terms of book fixing, right? Making subtle, small changes, right? And, and they're not innovative. If you look at this graph, most of the, most of the organizations spend 70, 80% of their time doing innovation, what they call as innovation, which is not truly innovative, right? For example, tech innovation in terms of your VR, right? Your, uh, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, right? Applied innovation, which is, you know, a tech that you don't have, for example, maybe a blockchain uh, or uh, maybe um, um, some sort of you know, uh, machine learning, right? A tech basically that you don't have. It seems like you know, this amount of spend that is there uh, in these two innovation part is very less. And the point that I want to make here is, you, in order to be innovative, in order to have the right feedback, there is a technology feedback which I think is fairly well understood. The left side, uh, the right side is really your uh, business uh, feedback, right? In order to get the right business feedback and build the right product, what you actually need is the right, f uh, right initial investment in terms of setting up this funnel, right? The, the innovation funnel. And who needs to be in there? You need to have all your partners, sometimes your internal uh, folks, as well as more importantly, you need to have users as well, right? So for example, there are two, two examples that I can give. One uh, you know, hospitality company, uh, travel company, introduced uh, an, an app. It sort of notified on your, uh, on your smartwatch as to what the flight, uh, flight schedule is. It was, in fact, very intrusive, right? You are in the airport, you are going through the security, but you sort of start looking at your watch, and people are annoyed, right? And it was rolled back, right? Because there's lack of uh, field testing there. So being innovative is good, but understanding how that innovation applies to your end customer, the ecosystem is important. Have you heard of Amazon uh, press release? Anyone? All right, so I was lucky to be part of one of the innovation days at Amazon. What they do is Amazon always has been very innovative. If you have an idea, they ask you to write, write a press release, right? And the press release has to say, what is this change going to do? How is it going to change, uh, blow the customer? And also, on the day, 
Amazon is going to publish to the world that this, there is a new feature. What are we going to say? How are we going to articulate the benefit to the customer, right? And this, anyone who has got a plan, who's got an idea, can go and then, you know, sort of submit this press release. It gets reviewed internally. It sort of gets reviewed by the PM. And, uh, and then once it is in a shape that everyone thinks, yes, this is going to be worthwhile implementing, that's how they implement, okay? I was part of it. I wrote a press release. And there was one that was selected. It was not mine. But you would be surprised to know Amazon Web Services was one of was was a result of one of the press releases. So think about it, right? Customer centric, you're innovating. The ideas that come can be out of the world, right? That's what has happened now. It's a it's a, it's a company that is more known for cloud than it's it's a real retail arm, right? So that is something that can happen, right? Uh, build this before you build anything else, right? If you didn't build any of it, it's fine. But build the feedback as early as you can, as much as you can. Uh, during your digital transformation, right? The next one is, okay, so I'm, I'm, I've adopted cloud, but I can't decide which cloud, right? Usual problem. So here is a guy, very happy. He has created something that is cloud agnostic. It can go anywhere, Google, Amazon, Azure, anywhere. But look what he's done. He's created a lot of technical debt, right? And um, and what is the point, right? What is the point? And then he's scratching his head because he, even if he wants to, even in a cloud agnostic world, if he wants to change, there's a cost associated with it. It's, it's not that, you know, there, there, there's no cost at all, right? And um, there are containers, there are innovations that can make you fairly cloud agnostic, right? And you can adopt a, on the platform whatever pass you think is relevant, you can still have these uh, technologies used to make it cloud agnostic, right? I mean, why do you adopt cloud? You adopt cloud because uh, you, want to, uh, you want to save, right? Huge saving could be made. Why can't you put some of that money away uh, for a rainy day when you, want to, uh, when you want to switch? And most importantly, the innovation that I want to call out, right? Because we talked about Amazon, that innovation is really going to help you, right? And if you are going to go cloud agnostic and then using the cloud, it, it is not advisable because there is less maintenance, more innovative, more cost saving. You could plan for that rainy day, but nonetheless, adopt cloud as is. Don't do over analysis. It actually always leads to uh, paralysis. But all of these you know, uh, things that I talked about right, uh, are quite relevant, quite important. It happens across the board. And it's a, it's a daily sort of a, uh, sort of a you know, um, routine for me hearing the same story again and again in terms of what the clients are doing, right? But you know, one of the things that I have realized while uh, you know, doing this digital transformation is it's all about data, right? You follow data, you get your architecture right, you, you get your business processes right, because data is what makes or breaks it. There was a recent study done that you know, the kids are spending more time, our teens are spending more time on, on, on uh, social apps. and. Uh, they drink less. There are also less pregnancies, by the way. But what it proves is there's a lot of data coming through from everywhere, right? And uh, when you sort of look at this, if I go back to this example and then you know, quickly look at this, you know what's happening? Most of these companies are trying to gather as much data as possible. It is, you say, they say digital transformation, but a lot of it is down to the data as well. For example, I spoke to this uh, you know, payment, next generation payment platform. I spoke to one of their uh, you know, product owners. He said, for me, it is not the payment platform. The moment I create this platform, I will have multiple uh, uh, you know, customers. It's a multi-tenant platform. I have got so much customer data that I could build some sort of analysis on back of that. I could offer, a, uh, I could offer them a new sort of uh, innovation. Let's say, for example, you're spending 10 pounds at Tesco. Uh, it might say, okay, so if you spend this, your, go your balance is going to be this, and you might not be able to buy, pay your direct debit or your rent or your mortgage, whatever that is, right? I want to be, I want to build that intelligence. So it is transformation, but on back of it, everyone is thinking, how do I monetize this? How do I use this data? So it is all about data, right? And, and I think it is also the least, um, uh, le least uh, it, it's given least importance, at least at the initial stages. Uh, for example, 
all this highly next generation, highly configurable, everything is fine. But again, you can't say I will stick to my Oracle database, right? That's not going to happen because you don't know today. A lot of this data that is coming through is unstructured, right? If you want to make use of this data, you can't have this one single Oracle database that sort of does everything today because that data ha can be a blob, can be in a NoSQL, it can be in a relational database, it can exist in any form, right? So don't worry, uh, don't use your previous approach uh, in this new generation because the data that is coming through is entirely different. And you also need to consider, see, another example that I had with one of my customers is, I want to build this new application and I've got this data, right? And then I ask this question, what does your application do? Oh, it just reads the data and then displays it to the customer, right? Easy, right? So there are a lot of easier way of doing it. You don't have to break your head, right? I want, I'm spending two years on this data strategy. I'm not getting it right. Then as your data is read only, right? So think about data. Data is very important. In God, we trust. Everyone else brings data, right? That, make, you know, that leads me nicely to the culture, right? The digital culture. So I, I wanted to spend some time on this digital culture, but I thought, what other way to emphasize culture learning than London Caps? Do you know what sort of uh, no, training, the preparation these guys go through? There are about 2,003, uh, sorry, 320 routes, about 25,000 roads that they have to memorize. It's about six miles within the radius of in and around, you know, Charing Cross, right? And if you fail through the process, there are different levels. They have to go back to the square one. They can, it can take up to four years to, uh, to clear this exam. Uh, and in these uh, four years, they have to fund themselves because it's, it's more like a full-time study. And it's also seen that, you know, London cabbies have less Alzheimer's as well as their brain capacity goes close by 25%, a particular part of their brain, though. It's not easy, right? If you learned it, you passed it, that's not enough. You need to remember it, right? London keeps changing. So the message, train the people. Train, train, train. You identify champ train, train, uh, you know, training champions, uh, and then they train others. That's how it should be, right? There's no, we are all here because we want to learn, we want to know about new things. And, and that's the point, right? So without training, without learning, your organization is not going to be digital. Last, the last one is, what matters the most is a, is a working software, right? If you look at this, what does your CEO would say, right? Uh, great job doing containers, great job using service mesh, or Great job introducing new business feature to the customer, right? And whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whether you're trying to climb a mountain or you're trying to create the next Amazon or Google or you might be trying to save your clan, right? Whatever it is, the proof is in the pudding, right? True success is a working software, <laughs> right? So that's the uh, end of my session. Thank you so much. I've got two minutes left. Happy to take any question. I'm here for the rest of the day as well. So if you need anything, uh, do reach out to me. Uh, I'm not trying to be uh, technical on this one, but I can talk a lot of technology as well. Thank you so much.